Hello, I am Dr. Elena Giusti. I am Associate Professor of Latin Literature and Language at the University of Warwick, um, and my specialism is in Augustan literature, and especially on Virgil's Aeneid. I wrote a book on Carthage in Virgil's Aeneid, and I am in the process of writing a book on uh, Dido and her reception. So I'm excited to be talking to you today about Virgil's characterization of Dido, and I hope that will, this will be useful to uh, your teaching of World of the hero. I am attaching a sample lesson element on the characterization of Dido uh, that is downloaded from the um, OCR site. And this includes four activities uh, that I would like to think about uh, or to critique with you. I'm especially interested about uh, the activity that asks um, about what we can understand about noble Roman women. Um, and about thinking about the characterizations uh, of Dido and whether it makes sense to list such characterizations in terms of Roman, unRoman, or ambiguous. I am proposing to change uh, the questions that these activities ask. So thinking about not what we can understand about Roman women, but about what we can understand about the constraints and expectations imposed upon Roman women, especially in the texts in which we find these women themselves. Um, I'm also proposing to think about how these constraints and expectations uh, affect the character of Dido, both in terms of her sex and in terms of her ethnicity, or I think we could also say um, race, um, and how uh, her sex and her Phoenician or Punic race interact in the representation uh, or male representation of what is, after all, a frightening and threatening other uh, from both points of view. I'm also proposing to think a little bit about the reception of her character and how both her sex and her race uh, may actually uh, empower different kind of readers, um, also perhaps among your students. In the OCR um, sample uh, lesson about what we can understand about Roman women, um, there is a link to a site uh, which would tell students that Roman uh, women had very little importance and independent citizens, uh, but they were influential as mother and wives, that devotion to one man was the ideal, and that a good Roman matron had to be chaste, honorable, and fertile. There are six examples in this website um, of Roman women, although one of the examples is the Sabine women, so I'm not really sure that they would qualify as Roman. Uh, but I think it is important to, 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 to bear in mind that out of these examples, two of the women, uh, Porcia and the wife of Caecinia Paetus, committed suicide for their husbands. Um, another one, Lucrezia, who is an important model for Dido, committed suicide after being raped. Uh, the Sabine women are also raped, uh, carried and uh, carried away and forced uh, to um, union uh, in order to make what will become the Romans. Um, and another woman, Marcia, the second wife uh, of Cato, was actually transferred to another man when she was pregnant and then was remarried to Cato. So what I wonder about is whether we couldn't look at different um, models of women and their agency. Um, in antiquity, we can think of Claudia Metelli, uh, who is the historical character behind Catullus's Lesbia, uh, surely a woman constrained by the patriarchal institutions of society and marriage, but one who found her own ways to circumvent them through lovers, drinking, gambling, and also probably poisoning her husband. Or we can think of Antony's wife, Fulvia, a woman who raised eight legions against Octavian in the Parasine War and who pierced uh, Cicero's tongue, apparently, um, after his decapitated head was uh, brought to her. Um, or of Livia Drusilla, the first empress at Rome, uh, who was the noble one in the emperor couple, so uh, who had uh, probably a lot of power um, in, um, in, in steering the first uh, imperial regime at Rome. We can also think of Sulpicia, um, we introduce readers to Sulpicia um, as, um, as a probable female author of antiquity, one who voices female desire. 
Um, so one way of thinking about these women, I think, is not what we can understand about them uh, through uh, male written texts, but what we can understand about the texts themselves and the constraints and expectations that these texts and the male society um, in which they were produced, a patriarchal society in which they were produced, impose upon uh, these women. And when we get to talk about Daido, we must ask ourselves in what way she does not wish to comply with these expectations um, and how does her character attempt to subvert uh, an order that relegates her to a subordinate role. And in this sense, both her sex and her uh, racialized status uh, must interact uh, in this attempt at subversion and in her characterization. And they are really two... Uh, characteristics that cannot be disentangled from one another. Um, the second activity of the OCR sample lesson asks to list actions and characteristics of Daido, and um, I'm just mentioning here that I worry about the fact that beautiful is the first characteristic that is listed, um, and that um, foreignness uh, comes later, and that there is never mention of her of her punic identity, which I think is something that uh, we must stress uh, with uh, students uh, talking about Daido. Um, as a Phoenician and a Punic character uh, rather than as a Roman character and also as a Queen of Africa. I do not think that uh, beautiful is the first characteristic that would come to mind to students for defining Dido, or I hope uh, it isn't. I think maybe one the most powerful uh, first characteristic of Dido is that of being a woman leader, a dux femina facti, in the words of Venus, when she takes um, uh, a number of companions uh, who uh, feel that they would like to rebel to the impositions of her brother um, and she uh, sets sail, she tricks her brother um, and she um, wanders through the Mediterranean to go and found a city on the shores of Tunisia. And in this respect, she is very similar, and in a number of other respects, but especially in this respect, she is very similar to Aeneas, to the point that talking about Roman and un-Roman characteristics in relation to Dido and Aeneas um, is uh, in many ways a futile exercise. One influential article that was published by Nicholas Horsfall in 1973 uh, sees Dido as the epitome of everything other and threatening and foreign to the Romans, both in her being a woman and a barbarian woman, but especially in her being a Carthaginian. Um, and so he, does, he says that the violence, greed, duplicity and hatred which Dido displays in the Aeneid uh, would have been linked by Virgil and his contemporary readers with the old hatreds of the Punic Wars. And there is a stereotypization of Phoenician people as untrustworthy uh, that would be at play here in the epic. Um, I think this is a very black and white reading of Dido. So um, I think that the 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 character of Dido is more blurred uh, than this, uh, but certainly uh, Virgil is working upon a number of expectations, both on women and on Carthaginians. So in this respect, it makes sense to talk about the concept of intersectionality to understand the character of Dido, uh, who is, uh, as I said, both a foreigner and a woman. Um, and oppressed um, by, um, by, by both sides of her identity. Um, and she's made a subordinate in this epic um, in terms of both, um, of both of these angles. An important study that I think could be applied to the characterization of Dido in the Aeneid was provided by Fromat Zeitlin um, in relation to um, the dynamics of misogyny in uh, Aeschylus's Oresteia, uh, in which she says that in a male authored text such as uh, of the past, such as Aeschylus's Oresteia, uh, whenever we have a woman's refusal, the refusal to 
uh, comply with her required subordinate role, this woman, and in this case she's talking about Clytemnestra, uh, must be compared to an Amazon. Um, and she talks about uh, this as an Amazon complex in the Greek sources, in the, in the male authored sources. So the idea that whenever a woman does not comply um, with um, the, the a required subordinate role, then uh, this refusal must lead to total domination of women, gynecocracy, and uh, ex the extreme forms of this um, fear project the enslavement of the murder or the murder of men. Um, and, um, and, and this applies very much, as we will see, to the character of Dido. Uh, in the Aeneid, uh, Dido herself, when she appears on the scene uh, in Book One, um, is uh, described just after the last, uh, the description of the last character on the frieze of the temple um, to Juno in Carthage, and that is the Amazon Penthesilea. So we have Aeneas seeing Penthesilea first and Dido next, and there is this projection of um, foreignness. Um, Onto, onto Dido, which will become stronger and stronger uh, in the epic, and especially in Book 4. At the same time, there is a sense that uh, this barbarian um, and this female nature interact not only in the character of Dido, but in uh, the city of Carthage itself, uh, which is perceived um, as a place of effeminacy uh, and, and sensual uh, the light uh, and one in which um, female domination is perceived as a cultural reality. Um, I think uh, in a very similar way as Zeitlin describes representations of the East and of what has become um, Clytemnestra's palace in the Oresteia. An important concept that can be borrowed from Edward Said's work Orientalism is that of an imagined geography to think about Carthage in the Aeneid. For Said, imagined geographies are a tool of power, a means of controlling and subordinating areas, and um, the fact that these geographies are just places of the imagination that do not comply with the reality reminds us that power is in the hands of those who have the right to objectify those that they are imagining. Um, and uh, so, so Asia uh, in, in, in Western and European imagination, he says, becomes um, a site kind of ripe with um, the uh, imagination um, of a Europe that attempts to articulate uh, the Orient like a genuine creator will do, so that the East becomes a silent and dangerous space that can only be imagined and so in that sense is always uh, an object and it's always subordinate. Something similar happens with the representation of Carthage in its reception. A famous example with which I opened this lecture is um, the portrait of Carthage in uh, Turner's Dido Building Carthage at the National Gallery where you can see that um, there is uh, a, um, a luxurious vegetation uh, which uh, is, has been interpreted as symbolic of fertility and uh, symbolic also of the fertility of colonial, of the Eastern colonial representation of a site uh, that is feminized so that it can be conquered um, and that in no way uh, represents the uh, arid climate of Tunisia. Uh, but if you read the Aeneid, uh, the fertility of the land already starts uh, in Aeneid 1. So it is a trope uh, that this, this, this painting uh, is bringing forward from the text itself. Another way of thinking about the text that um, I have um, used in an article is that of thinking about it as uh, what Michel Foucault would have called a heterotopia. So a site in which uh, diverse and discontinuous and ambiguous slices of time and space can be accommodated. Um, and these, these places are illusory places that end up commenting upon, uh, upon the place um, from which we see them uh, rather than having real agency. So in a sense, 
for Carthage, this is very real in, with respect to what uh, anything that Carthage or, or Dido can represent ends up telling us something about Rome and Romans uh, rather than the site uh, of Carthage itself. An example of this can be seen in the uh, arrival um, at Carthage in Book 1 on the Aeneid. This is the second arrival at Carthage. Because the first arrival is at the harbour, which is also a very interesting place where uh, there are strange juxtapositions of, of, different, uh, of, of, of different places of myth. Uh, but the arrival um, at the city of Carthage is interesting because it has been noted that, um, to an extent, uh, Aeneas seems to be arriving uh, not at the site of original Carthage, but at the site uh, of um, the, um, the colony that uh, Augustus was founding uh, in Carthage and it was called Colonia Iulia Concordia Cartago. Uh, and Augustus, for the first time since the destruction of Carthage in 146, attempted to build a colony there, although this was something that Caesar himself wanted to do. Uh, but the Romans were very wary of doing it before, because Scipio Emilianus had apparently cursed the soil of Carthage after destroying it. Uh, so, so this is part of the new, uh, the new regeneration, the new building, and also the new colonial enterprise of Augustus. And you can see in the text that when um, that when Aeneas um, and Achates arrive in Carthage, Carthage look extremely Roman. Uh, they even have uh, magistrates uh, and the Senate, and they have theatres, or one theatre. Um, once these places were Magalia, which is a, a Punic word for huts, uh, but now they seem to be a Roman colony. And so there is this sense of displacement uh, of this colonial site of the imagination um, where uh, both the Roman, Roman imagination and the, Roman, the historical reality of Roman colonialism is projected. And in book four, uh, there is something interesting happens because we seem to almost go backwards in time because now, now in book four is the time where Dido is in love with Aeneas, so she stopped working at the city and this um, interruption of works seems to, seems to make uh, Carthage Punic again almost. So the, 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 the towers no longer began, the works are broken off and idle, um, and the half-constructed city uh, remembers, reminds us of the ruins of the half-destroyed city um, as, as it could have been uh, before Augustus uh, attempted to rebuild it. And it is telling that when Mercury goes there uh, to tell Aeneas to, to get on with his enterprise, he uh, touches again the Magalia, the huts, uh, the Punic huts uh, of this place. So the, the Carthage has become Punic again. So again, it is very much a site of the imagination. It is also, importantly, a fictional site for um, a fictional and fake story. So Macrobius in his Saturnalia already noted that everyone knew that the story of Dido and Aeneas was not true uh, because there was a different tradition according to which uh, Dido uh, never met Aeneas. She actually died um, on a funeral pyre in order not to marry the local king Ayarbas. And the traditional dates uh, of uh, the foundation of Carthage and the fall of Troy um, are uh, too far in antiquity um, uh, to have um, allowed the two to, 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 to meet. Um, we uh, are uncertain as to whether Virgil invented the story or as to whether the story was probably invented by Naivius at the time of the Punic Wars in his poem of the First Punic War. But it is interesting that Roman readers would have recognized this as fiction.
It is also generally recognized that Virgil himself um, draws attention to uh, the, the, the love story between Dido and Aeneas being a fiction uh, in uh, inserting in the middle of book four his personification of fama, which is rumor and gossip and is personified like a huge and horrible monster that tells um, lies and it never sleeps, it has a mouth and a tongue that are never silent um, and uh, it... Um, it, it can destroy uh, cities in the epic. Um, and at the time, it was mixing fact and fiction alike in equal parts in telling the story that Dido and Aeneas uh, fondled the winter together. And um, the, uh, the, the importance uh, of, um, of fama and of gossip for the creation of historical lies um, was not lost in the reception of this figure. You can see uh, here Paul Weber's Das Gerücht in 1943, which uses Virgil's representation of fama um, to uh, represent the lies and gossip told about Jewish people uh, just before the Holocaust, during the Holocaust. Um, and even nowadays a lot of talk uh, has been made about fake news uh, and the ways in which uh, fake news um, affect uh, contemporary politics and history. So uh, the other story uh, of Dido is normally um, referred to as the story of the historical Dido. Uh, it is told in a number of sources, um, mostly uh, most uh, a length in um, Justin's epitome of the Philippic history of Pompeius Strogos, who wrote this history uh, more or less at the time of Virgil. And according to this story, as I mentioned before, um, Dido uh, was um, uh, Dido killed herself in order to remain faithful to her husband and, and not be forced to marry a local king. The uh, Renaissance uh, reception of Dido divides up into Virgil's Dido and Dido as the chaste widow. Um, a famous example is the double representation of Dido in Dante and Petrarch. So Dante uh, represents Dido in hell, uh, calling her her, 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 she who killed herself for love, Coleike Sanchise Amorosa. Uh, but Petrarch in his triumph of chastity um, says that she was, um, driven to death by the pursuit of honesty, not by vain love, as the common cry would have it. And we can hear the common cry there would be Dante. Obviously, both representations of Dido as the lustful lover who kills herself because of her sin and the chaste widow like Lucrezia who kills herself um, um, in order to, 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 to be free from uh, the constraints um, of imposed uh, sexual union on her um, are both, um, I think, two sides of patriarchal uh, discourse and patriarchal constraints. Dido, in um, the reception, in the scholarly reception of the Aeneid, uh, is always felt like another. Um, a character that has to be interpreted. This is very clear from um, Alessandro Schiazzaro's article Furthest Voices in Virgil's Dido, in which he uh, pushes forward uh, the interpretation that we have seen in Nicholas Horsfall about the dangerousness and the threat inherent in Dido. And he opens the article by saying that reading Dido in the Aeneid and beyond has always been an intensely charged literary and political um, game and uh, we as readers are allowed to delve into the intertextual complexities of her character and to try and uh, understand the relationship between the intertextual traces and her unconscious impulse in book four and by intertextual traces Schiazzaro is mostly referring to Dido acting as a kind of second media uh, and uh, there is plenty, um, already Already, the ancient commentators to Virgil recognized that the character of Dido was um, imitated upon the character of Medea in Apollonius, but Cesaro goes farther in uh, looking at the character of 
tragic media in Euripides uh, to show uh, that Dido poses a real threat to the hero in the epic. In The Last Trojan Hero from 2014, uh, Philip Hardy would devote a chapter to Dido and her reception in the Aeneid, um, also uh, opens by saying that women in the Aeneid are difficult to read uh, and that Venus, for instance, is not what she seems and Dido as well um, he has to be interpreted according to a number of intertextual and allusive clues that she gives to the reader. So there is a sense that uh, uh, we as readers have to side with Aeneas and with the male gaze and the male imagination in order to make sense of this character who can only interpret it according to a network of other female and mostly barbarian characters. Now, um, I would like to suggest uh, in the remaining time of this lecture that this is um, obviously um, a doable um, um, approach, uh, but there are other ways, especially in her reception, uh, to um, allow Dido's character to speak uh, in her own agency. So uh, the uh, chapter by uh, Philip Hardy in The Last Trojan Hero was entitled La Donna Immobile, uh, which is obviously taken by Verdi's uh, Rigoletto, um, whose aria say, woman is a flighty thing, um, like a feather in the wind, she changes in voice and thought, always a lovely pretty face in tears or in laughter, it's always untrue. So there's always this idea that, um, uh, that, that women are untrustworthy and interesting, this stereotype type of untrustworthiness is also also in the case of Dido mixes with the stereotype of uh, Phoenician people. Verdi's uh, Rigoletto is taken from uh, no other text than the Aeneid itself and this is what uh, Her Mercury says to Aeneas uh, when he tries to convince him that he has to go and leave uh, Carthage um, and that there is a threat inherent in Dido and uh, here uh, Mercury says to Aeneas varium et mutabile semper femina um, so uh, with making sense of the enjambement in the Latin we can translate um, a variable and mutable thing so this is neuter in Latin so it's an object always is and then we have the woman so it's a line that um, objectifies uh, the woman and uh, the female experience uh, very explicitly in the epic and that will have um, an important uh, future. So as I mentioned before, Dido is always um, represented then as, as, as some other threatening and uh, untrustworthy characters. So it is um, remarked upon that she's like Medea, but she is also like Procne. So she says about Aeneas, could an I have caught his body, torn it apart, scattered it over the waves, put his companions to the sword as Canius to, and set him as a dish for his father's table. Um, so there is a mixture of a memory of Medea scattering in the waves um, her brother Absyrtus and of uh, Procne giving to her uh, barbarian husband Tereus, uh, his son Itis, to eat. Dado is also remarked often to be like Cleopatra uh, in a number of respects um, as being a, a powerful queen uh, in Africa, um, although Egypt was not in antiquity. Um, conceptualized as Africa um, and in uh, um, the Aeneid itself uh, there seems to be at least one intertextual suggestion uh, between the two that links the two queens so Dido is described as being pale at the prospect of incoming death at the end of book four and it is exactly the same representation that we find in Cleopatra on the shield of Aeneas in book eight. Dido is also uh, represented as a uh, Punic uh, characters. She is a bit like uh, the Carthaginian woman uh, Sophonisba, whose story is told in Livy. She is uh, like Hannibal, especially in her um, in her curse in Book Four, uh, where she also asks for an avenger. Uh, to rise from her bones and she's also a little bit like Hasdrubal's wife this is the last woman of the city uh, who will similarly 
kill herself um, on a pyre in the temple of Eshmon. More than anything, Dido is synonymous with Carthage itself, and this is very clear in um, in uh, the at the end of the Aeneid, where there is a simile between the death of Dido um, and uh, the destruction uh, of Carthage in the history. But if it is true that Dido can be othered um, like a barbarian woman, uh, there are other ways in the reception uh, to um, kind of reclaim both her female and her Punic identities. Um, an interesting um, um, uh, example of Dido's reception, uh, this is from 2017, uh, is the album of Laura Marling, Semper Femina, where she uh, retakes, um, kind of reclaims uh, the enjambment that we have seen in Virgil uh, to make it as symbolic of the woman um, experience. And she also understands that uh, uh, there is an issue with male authored epic um, in um, book four itself. And she says that she found, she found this male imagination working uh, even when she was herself composing. So she says that she started writing Semper Femina as if a man was writing about a woman. And then she realized, well, it's not a man, it's me. I don't need to pretend that it's, I am a male author, that it's a man to justify the intimacy or the way I'm looking and feeling about women. There are a number of interesting studies about the female reception of Dido. Um, a famous one is Marlene Desmond reading Dido um, about uh, gender textuality and the medieval Aeneid, especially on Dido and Christine de Pisan. Um, and interestingly, uh, Dido, um, both um, Marlene Desmond and Fiona Cox note that Dido has not been a favorite character of feminist thinkers. Helen Sissou, for instance, um, claimed quite explicitly in La Journée that she is not Dido because Dido uh, inhabits a sort of victimhood um, and she ends up um, showing the constraints um, of patriarchy um, that, that we have seen at work um, in the in the rest of this lecture. Another uh, case of contemporary reception of Dido is Elena Ferrante, uh, uh, Elena Ferrante's trilogy, a tetralogy uh, in which um, we find um, over and over uh, the character uh, of Dido as a way of thinking about female experience uh, for both um, Elena and Lina. There are a number of uh, possible uh, ways to reconstruct uh, the Punic, Punic identity in Dido in Virgil's Aeneid, but these are very limited. Um, there are um, obvious hints at Carthage's Punic name, um, Cartadast, which meant new city in the Aeneid. There is the word Magalia or Mapalia that we have seen, which was actually Punic for hats. Uh, that may be a memory of the Barkids behind the name of Sekius's nurse Barkids. And um, there is Dido's devotion to Juno, uh, which can be linked to uh, the Semitic uh, goddess Tanit, uh, goddess of Carthage, and also possible connections with the goddess Ashtart, um, a Semitic version of Diana. But overall, it is really difficult to um, reconstruct Punic identity um, within this um, Roman epic. Having said so, um, there have been attempts in Dido's reception uh, to uh, reclaim Dido for post-colonial intents um, and uh, post-colonial readings of Dido uh, look especially at the uh, historical Dido um, and that is the story that they claim, not the Dido who was made uh, to meet Aeneas by the Roman sources. Um, a couple of examples in Tunisian literature are um, two novels by Fazi Mella and Sophie El Gulli, but Daido has also been used in other post-colonial contexts, including uh, the Elegie de Carthage uh, by the Senegalese uh, poet Leopold Sedar Senghor. 
And the name of Dido also plays, um, I think, an important part in the story of Dido Elizabeth Bell, which has, um, uh, was reconstructed from a poet, an unattributed 18th century painting um, of um, Dido Elizabeth Bell with her cousin Elizabeth Murray um, in London, and which has received a representation in film in 2013. Uh, this is a woman who was born into slavery uh, by um, from a mother uh, who was an African slave, Maria Bell, and her father, uh, Sir John Lindsay, was a British career naval officer and was stationed there. And she was then entrusted to be raised by her uncle, William Murray, who as Lord Chief of Justice ruled uh, in a significant slavery case, um, which um, showed in uh, 1772 that slavery had no precedent in common law uh, in England. And so um, significantly... Um, furthered the case against slavery. So in the case of Dido Elizabeth Bell, Dido uh, can be seen to talk, speak of miscegenation, um, and this is what she um, spoke of um, to actress Chipo Chung uh, in um, a performance of Christopher Marlowe's Dido Queen of Carthage from 2016 from the Royal Shakespeare Company, which uh, really attempted to replace uh, Dido in, in Africa, both in terms of the staging and in terms of the costumes, um, and also in Chipo Chung's own identitarian experience. So the actress is uh, half Zimbabwean, half Chinese, and she also also has lived as a as a refugee and so she said that the Dido story to her spoke both to her refugee status and to um and to her mixed race statues and when she um saw uh, a production at the National Theatre of Marlowe's Dido Queen of Castles. She just didn't understand why this whole race issue of Dido had been whited out. Um, and she felt that this was because people were mainly interested in classics, um, um, as as also which is also felt to be um, a white people domain. And she, she felt that uh, that went together with the fact that she was the only black person in the audience there. Um, and that probably she saw in the Dido story things that uh, white people didn't necessarily see. And she said she was unsatisfied by this performance because she is from Africa and the play set in Africa and she couldn't understand why uh, Dido then didn't seem to be African at all, uh, nor to be Phoenician or Punic for that matter. So I thank you very much for listening. I am providing um, a handout with a number of bibliographical sources um, and I hope that I have opened some different ways uh, of looking at the characterization of Dido, uh, which can hopefully be useful for uh, A-levels um, as well. And I'm looking forward to discussing this material with you. Thank you.